Hello and welcome back to the Idiot's Guide to Philosophy. Today we're going to take a look at Plato, and yes, I know we covered a lot of that already, but that was just his moral and political philosophy. Besides, somebody forgot to do this. Someone once said of Plato that he was so significant that the whole of Western thought is nothing but a series of footnotes to him, and today hopefully we'll find out why. What's the time? It's Plato time! Did someone say Plato time? What? It's me. Plato. You know, by this point I'm not even surprised. You're not? I've been dead for literally thousands of years. Yeah. I'm just insane. Or stupid. I've accepted that. We help! Oh dear. One of the important things that Herr Commandant forgot to mention was a little something Plato came up with called the Theory of Forms. It's- I can explain that. What? Well, it's my idea. I should explain it. It starts with a little thought experiment. Now be a good little boy and get me something to write with. Mm, I can't believe this sh Fine. So, uh, I see people have things called computers now. I think that's- how do you say it? Totally tubular. Groovy. Back in my day, we had... I got your friggin' writing material. Very good. Now, let's take a look at a picture. What is this a picture of? Well, that's easy. It's a circle. Wrong. It is not so much a circle as it is an attempt to represent a circle. If you were to look closely at this circle, you'd see that it is irregular and imperfect. It isn't perfectly round, and it's composed of ink. It has depth because of that ink. It isn't a perfect circle, therefore not a true circle. Then what is a perfect circle? I'm glad you asked. I have an excellent example. A perfect circle isn't any physical circle. It's the idea of the circle that is perfect. Anything less than that is doomed to be nothing but an imitation of the idea of the perfect circle. Ah, I think I see where you're going with this. So the idea of something is what you call the form of something, right? Yes. Also, the form of something doesn't necessarily mean the shape of something. For example, the form of justice or the form of liberty have nothing to do with shape. And it doesn't have to be just circles. There can be a form for anything? Exactly. There is a form for everything. And these forms are not just ideas in your head either. Let's suppose we are looking for the form of something. If we are looking for the form of, uh, say, the perfect butt, for example. Oh, yes, that's, that's very close to the form indeed. Oh, yes. Daddy like. Hey, focus. Form of perfect butt. But, uh, uh, yes, yes. If we are looking for the form of the perfect butt, we either know what it is or we don't. If we already know what it is, we don't need to seek it. But if we don't know what it is, how will we know it when we find it? If we go looking for something and we don't know what it looks like, how do we know it when we see it? Oh boy. So what you're saying is that we both know these forms and we don't know them. Yes. If you didn't already have an acquaintance with these forms, how would you know a perfect anything if you saw it? Forms never change. When you do geometry and study shapes, do the fundamental shapes change? No, they are always the same. The form of a perfect square always has four sides. You'd have to be retarded to refute that. How do you know this? Knowledge of the forms is in your head. Forms are real, unchanging, and exist independently of the minds that know them. Then... Where do the forms exist? How? If I'm talking to you about the number 7, I can't ask you where the number 7 exists. If forms exist, then they must be objects that don't exist in time or space. Which brings us to our next topic, metaphysical dualism! Let me handle this one. Oh. Fine. Don't mind me, I'm only f***ing Plato himself. As complicated a term as it may sound, metaphysical dualism is something that you already know a great deal about. It's the idea of two realities coexisting. It's a concept frequently found in books, movies, and video games. 
While some people only see it as a useful plot device, Plato saw it as a compromise between the world of constant change that Heraclitus saw and the world where no change occurs that Parmenides proposed. On the one hand, change obviously does occur in the world, so Heraclitus is right. But on the other hand, there are eternal and unchanging things like the forms, so Parmenides is right too. Hence, there are two coexisting realities, a world of change and flux, our world, and a world of eternal ideas, the world of the forms. Plato called the unchanging world the intelligible world. It's not a physical reality. You can't actually go there. It's not located in time or space. But it is accessible through your ability to reason. Are you done butchering my work? I've just got one more question. Can you explain the relationship between the forms and the things that they relate to, their particulars? Of course I can. I'm Plato. Now, before something physical can exist, there needs to be some kind of conception of that thing. That means that before you can exist, your form needs to exist. In the same way that a statue in the sun casts a shadow, every individual thing is just a shadow of its form. Now, if you want to understand the relationship between the realities better, we should examine my famous allegory of the cave. No time. I gotta keep the video relatively short. Do you know how long the average YouTube user's attention span is? It's not very long. But it's the cave allegory. The cave allegory. I got a lot of tail for that one, let me tell you. Can't. Gotta move on to talk about your cosmology. I don't get no respect. At least let me describe cosmology. Okay, okay, go ahead. Cosmology is the discipline of seeking a better understanding of the origins of the universe. For example, the cosmology of the Christians is that God created the universe. The cosmology of Tolkien is that Inu Iluvatar began the Great Choir. And the cosmology of Scientology is that aliens did it. According to the ancient Greeks, you could not get something from nothing. If you went around the streets of ancient Athens saying that a god had created the universe from nothing, they'd lock you up in the Greek equivalent of Arkham Asylum. Since it was impossible to think of something coming from nothing, Plato proposed the concept of a demiurge, or a craftsman, who took the raw materials of the forms and crafted our reality from them. Please bear in mind that there are some significant differences between Plato's demiurge and the traditional Christian Judeo god. For example, the demiurge is not omnipotent. He could not create the universe from nothing. In his work Timaeus, Plato describes the universe not as a hodgepodge of atoms in motion like Democritus thought, but rather as a living thing that is harmonious in its nature. One of the significant parts of Plato's cosmology is that it is teleological. A teleological explanation is one that explains things in terms of purpose and intent. For example, a teleological explanation of the water I'm boiling on the stove is not the technical answer of the water being heated to the point of boiling. The teleological answer is that I'm boiling water because I'm starving and I haven't got anything to eat but ramen. Plato thought that a mechanical explanation of the world was insufficient because the world changes so much and so often. The universe is so complex and works together so well that Plato believed it all pointed to the idea of an intelligent creator, the Demiurge. Seems like a good idea, right? Of course it's a good idea! So that's Plato. How well does he hold up after all these years? Pretty darn well. For reasons I don't have time to get into right now, Plato's theory of forms got a lot of negative reviews, but it still shaped Western thought for well over a thousand years. A lot of people don't like Plato because he stresses that our world is not the real one. Therefore, science is not as important as we modern folk would like to think that it is. But for those of you who feel this way, don't worry. Next time, I'll tell you about Plato's apprentice. A guy who goes by the name of Aristotle. Maybe you've heard of him. Taught that guy everything he knows. I haven't forgotten that you didn't tell them about the cave, though. Revenge is a dish best served cold, idiot. That's nice. Run along now, you demented little figment of my warped imagination. Make me. Democracy. What? Where? Ah! Until next time, this is The Idiot, signing off. I'm going slightly mad. I'm going slightly mad. Don't forget to subscribe. With one click, you help contribute to our complete domination of your collective minds. You do want us to dominate your collective minds, don't you? <laughs>